church say amen. What a great, great joy it is for us to be associated with a God that is able to sustain, to be associated with a God that is with us through all of our trials, through all of our pains, through all of our tribulations. And if we could impress just but one thing upon you this morning, it would be to serve him. For in serving God, there is benefit. In serving God, there is reward. There is a glory to be had from being a servant of God, even if it means that as being a servant, you are suffering. And so we've had the opportunity of studying from the standpoint or from the subject matter of the suffering servant. And this morning, we're going to deliberate for a while about the question of suffering. And certainly, you know what the question of suffering is. Because if we've ever been made to suffer, if we've never had difficulty or hard times in our lives, the question that we are always led to ask is why? Why is there suffering in the world? And more than that, why is there suffering in my life? And hopefully this morning, we will be helped a little to answer that question or other questions that you might have as we look through this lens of the Bible that shines a light on the person of Gideon. So if you will, get your Bibles and join us, meet us, at uh, Judges chapter 6 is where we are going to have our springboard and hopefully before we are done we will have journeyed from the first chapter of Judges all the way to chapter 6. But in Judges chapter 6 we are introduced to a judge of Israel in the person of Gideon. And the thing that we learn or we find about Gideon is that Gideon is first and foremost a prophet. And I like to phrase that in that manner. He is first and foremost a prophet. And after that, we find that Gideon is a reluctant military leader for the nation of Israel. And I, I say it that way, he's first and foremost a prophet. That's something that I share with men, young men, as we engage them in a marital counseling. And the thing I like to impress upon all men is that first and foremost, you are prophet and priest in your family. So the, the, the first Judges chapter 6, verse 32. Therefore, on that day, he 
called him Jerubbaal, saying, "Let Baal plead against him, because he hath thrown down his altar." So we see the prophet experiencing some hurt, some damage. People actually are calling him names because he does not go along with the status quo. He does not go along with the agenda that has been set before he arrives on the scene. It's a very interesting stage because as we look at judges, we will find that uh, that this Jerubbaal or Gideon just appears almost it seems as if from nowhere. He's like a lot of other prophets that we are introduced to. He appears and then he starts to proclaim the word of God as he is fulfilling the mission of God. Gideon is made most famous in Jewish folklore because of his military exploits against the Midianites. And we can understand that because we all like and we have an infatuation with great uh, military leaders. And that's what, what uh, Gideon turns out to be for Israel. Midian, we find, was a region in the Arabian desert. The Midianites were nomadic peoples, uh, uh, nomadic tribes that were going about and they are reputed for their ability to conquer. But they don't just conquer, they are able to really inflict hurt, to inflict real damage, to cause real pain, and to make you feel real suffering. So you might remember from your previous Bible studies or readings as it relates to the Midians how they're constantly in battle with the children of Israel. Well, one of the things you might have missed is the fact that the Midianites were not just people that the Israelites are fighting against, they are actually relatives. They are actually family members. And if you ever began a course of study where you are studying the Genesis and start reading in Genesis, you start to meet a lot of people who have uh, difficult names to pronounce, the Jebusites and the Perabites and the Hittites and the Midianites are one of these people that stuck in the codex of the text. But Genesis chapter 25 gives us an interesting little tidbit of information as it relates to the Midianites. And it is the fact that they claim Abraham as their father. And not only do they claim Abraham as their father, you see that? They have the same claim as the children of Israel. And if you will look at Genesis chapter 5, chapter 20 to 25, one of the things that you will find is that uh, Abraham marries a wife. And that woman's name is Keturah. And one of the children, one of the sons that Abraham has from Keturah is Midian. And so Midian goes on to have offspring and children and they grow in number. And it is here that we are dropped into the narrative that we will be speaking from this morning. Not only are we in the middle of our narrative, we are also at doctrinal point number one. As it relates to serving and as it, is, it relates to suffering, doctrinal point number one. Sometimes your suffering is caused by family. 
Sometimes your suffering is caused by family. Now I'm just going to let that rest with you because I see through the camera and some of your sanctified sanctuaries that you call in your living room this morning that some of you just say amen, amen, and amen. Some suffering in your life is unavoidable and a lot of suffering is caused by people that are in your family. Now listen, here's a particularly interesting thing about family. We don't get to choose who our family is. Amen. And I know that's right. Because if I got a chance to choose, I think I would choose as my brother Robert Smith. Now I know some of you are thinking, who is Robert Smith? Robert Smith is the brother billionaire that paid off all of the student loans of the kids who were graduating from Morehouse College last year at commencement ceremony. Some of you are thinking, oh, preacher, you just want that man to pay your student loans. No, I don't. Because if he was my brother and I could choose, I would never have a student loan. Amen. We don't get to choose our family. And sometimes, that's where the conflict starts. Because if you were like I was, your mother went away one day, went to some place they called a hospital, and she showed back up with your baby brother. Or they showed up with your sister. And the struggle has been on ever since. And sometimes there is struggle, and that struggle takes place because of family. So it is particularly fitting that Israel finds themselves wrestling with the Midianites. It is particularly fitting that these people find themselves constantly in a battle with something that's called family. And if you look at the text, it's interesting to me that when they start to name people who are of great disdain, they never say my brother. It's always those Midianites. Those wicked And know this, sometimes we do have personalities of that sort in our family. And you know what? At the end of the day, they are still family. Judges chapter 6, verse 1. The Bible says the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. Let's not gloss over that because we like to talk about my brother, my brother, my brother. Let's not forget your evil also. The children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years. You see that? That sometimes God has a hand in our suffering, that sometimes God has a hand in directly in what's going on in our lives. Verse 2 says, the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel, and because Midianites, the children of Israel, made them dens which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. They're hiding. They made some hiding places. And so it was when Israel had sown that the Midianites came up and the Amalekites and the children of the east, even they came up against them. You ever felt that way? That every time you plant something, somebody in your family comes to knock it down, that's what they're experiencing. Every time they build something, somebody in their family comes to, to cause a little discord and distress. Verse 4 says, they encamped against them. Isn't that just like a brother? Instead of helping, they're kicking against them and destroying their increase of the earth till thou come into Gaza and left no substance for Israel. They were so rough on them, they wouldn't even leave 
leave anything for them to eat, neither sheep, nor oxen, nor ass. For they came up with their cattle and their tents, and they came as grasshoppers for multitude. For both they and their camels were without number, and they entered into the land to destroy it. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites. Let me translate that for you out of the Jerome Peterson translation version of the Bible. They left them broke. They left them without any money. I know somebody can say amen. Because you've dealt with a brother and you've dealt with a sister and when you're done with them, you spit. And they, they've taken so much from them that they've left them impoverished. The children of Israel cried unto the Lord. Yeah. You, you can be so torn. You can be so broken. Your relationships with your family can be so strained that you are caused to suffer. And upon suffering, we do the age-old familiar thing. Ah, oh, we remember how to call on God. Sometimes we suffer. And our suffering is caused by family members. Yeah, in Judges chapter 6, verse 7, the Bible goes on to say, And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites that the Lord sent a prophet to the children of Israel. Have you ever cried unto God? Because usually when we cry to God, our cry is filled with what we think God should provide to us at our time of suffering. Our cries include how we think God should provide during our present crisis. And isn't it interesting that the children of Israel cry unto God and he sends a prophet. Now that's already Sometimes you 
your suffering is caused by your friends. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, well, wait a minute, preacher. The thing that you read doesn't really go with your point. Yes, it does. See, in order to understand what God is saying, you're going to have to go back a little bit. You see, we're going to have to go back to Judges chapter 1. And the thing that we said earlier was sometimes your suffering is caused by family. And you don't get to choose your family. But doctrinal point number two, sometimes your suffering is caused by your friends. And guess what? You, you get to choose your friends. You may not be able to choose your family, but you sure can choose your friends. You might not be able to choose your family, but you can control how you deal with your family. And some of us need to choose our friends more wisely. Somebody needs to learn how to govern themselves amongst the people that they choose to hang out with. There are some people you should just distance yourself from. And it doesn't matter if they're your family or if they're your friend. And God is looking at Israel. God is looking at the people that he chose. And God is saying, you need to choose your friends better. See the 
your mom passing the word around. Man, you don't have to get rid of them. Listen, man, let me tell you how you do. Just charge them a little money. How many of you know? Money isn't everything. How many of you know? These contracts that they are entering into is not the thing that God would have them to do. I'm reminded of Saul. When God has told him, go in and utterly destroy. And Saul looks around and thinks, well, let's keep the best of the sheep and keep a little of the money. God sends the prophet Nathan and said, did not God tell you to utterly destroy? Well, we did. Uh, you know, well, what's this I hear of the bleeding of the sheep? And now here, the judges of the Israelites are doing the same thing. Well, let's just think, let's let them stay and we just take a little money from them. Verse 35 says, the Amorites would dwell there also so that they became their tributaries. Now, in Judges chapter 2, verse 1, the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochum and said, I made you to go up out of Egypt, this is God talking, and I brought you unto the land which I swear unto you, your fathers. And God says, I said, I will never break my covenant with you. Verse 2. My commandment to you was, ye shall make no league with the inhabitants of this land. What is God saying? God is saying, don't make friends with these people. There are some of us that are calling some people our friends. And we would be better off, and you would be better served, and God would truly be honored if your allegiance and your responsibilities were dedicated to God. And God You see, you see, now we want 
God to do for us what God wanted us to do for ourselves. God says, now, I will not drive them out. I'm not going to do for you what I told you to do. But I'm going to leave them right there. I'm going to leave them right where you allowed them to be. Those people that you allowed in your life, I'm going to leave them right there. Those contracts that you entered into, I'm going to make you honor of them. And there are going to be thorns in your sides. Their gods are going to be snared to you. And it shall come to pass when the angel of the Lord speak these words unto all the children of Israel, that the people lifted up their voice and they wept. Old Ray Charles used to have a song that said, Oh, it's crying time again. And the truth of the matter is, there are some times in our lives when we are suffering and all we can do is cry. And the truth of the matter is, we're crying the tears that we've laid for ourselves. As the scripture goes on, Judges chapter 6, verse 11, there came an angel of the Lord. He sat down under an oak which was in Ophrah that pertained unto Joash, the Abizarite, and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress. Uh, because he was trying to hide his little patch of ground from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. By, by, by parallel, that phrase means man of strength. So the angel comes to him and says, Strong! Jesus! 
Does somebody there say the same thing today? I don't need God to open up the Red Sea. I just need him to pay this bill. And this strong man by the name of Gideon, this strong prophet, struggling because of the suffering that he's seen. And he says an interesting thing. He says, now the Lord has forsaken us. I want you to know, God is never going to leave you. It is us that leaves him. But the strong man says, God has forsaken us. And he has delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Gideon, that's so unfair. Brother, if that's your, that's your testimony, that's unfair. You're being unfair to God. Sister, if that's your testimony, that's unfair. You're sitting here talking about God has delivered us into the hands of the Midianites and you cannot cancel out all of the wrong that you have done, all of the times you have transgressed the word of God. Doctrinal point number three. God is with you no matter who causes the suffering. Yeah, we talked about sometimes our family members cause suffering. Sometimes our friends cause suffering. Sometimes I cause my own suffering. And what I love about this is no matter whose hands I am suffering at, God is with you. No matter where I am in life, no matter what it is that I experience, God is with you. The psalmist says this in Psalm 139, O oh Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. God, you know me. You know my sitting down and you know my getting up. You know me. God, you understand my thoughts of our offer. That is to say, you know Doctrinal point number four, don't allow 
suffering to stifle your faith. Don't allow suffering to stifle your faith. You see, Gideon, as strong as he is, because of the suffering that he sees taking place and because of his personal suffering, his faith is taking a hit. He's being led to doubt. And suffering has a way of grabbing a hold of your mind. Yeah, you can suffer so greatly that your mind can be captivated. And your mind can be so troubled that you can feel it all over your body. And usually it's, it's right about himself is not immune from struggle, from doubt, and from suffering. And we see this even from this prophet, that his suffering has started to affect his faith. Judges chapter 6 verse 14, the Lord looked upon him and said, go in this thy might. God says, sir, you're struggling right now, but you're a strong man. God says, sister, woman, you're struggling right now, but you're a strong woman. And I want you to go, I want you to get up. And I want you to go on. Well, God, how am I going to do it? Go in the strength that I gave you. I don't have any more strength. Let God be your strength. I don't have any more power. Let Preacher, I just don't think I... Let God be whatever you don't have any more of. So God says to Gideon, I want you to get up and I want you to go. And I want you to go in your strength and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I said thee? God said, I need you to get over where you are. Some of us are having our own little private pity party. Some of us, oh, some of us, all we can do is cry, woe is me. And God is saying, get up. There's somebody that has it a whole lot worse than you. There's someone who is having a struggle that has taken them down a whole lot further than you are. The place that you are in, you can get up from. And God is saying, get up and go in your shred because I'm with you and I'm sending you. And he said unto him, oh my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? How can I save Israel? Behold, he sounds like Moses, my family is poor. See, that's Israel's problem. They're worried about the money. And you're sitting here talking about the money. Amen. And many of us worrying about the money. I'm poor, so I can't do he says, my family is the poorest family in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. God has chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. God's foolishness is far greater 
than man's wisdom. The Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. Don't allow your suffering to stifle you, to stifle your faith. And more than that, Gideon, don't allow your suffering to bring you out of the power that God has endowed you with. What should we do? What's, what's, what's our application point here? How, how can we apply this to our lives? It's simple. Allow God to alleviate your suffering. God can take away your pain. God can take away your hurt. God can take your situation and turn it around. God is fascinating that the thing you wrestle with for years, God can turn it in a day. And so, when we come to expect this condition of suffering, when we come to understand the conflicts of life, and moreover, when we come to understand that God is looking to use us as faithful servants in a world that's suffering, to have the world to see that although they are in pain, he has already set the cure. And I wonder if we are willing to allow ourselves to be a part of God's plan in alleviating suffering, in alleviating pain, in alleviating the eels of the world. Allow God to fix your life. Allow God to fix your mind. Allow God to fix your heart. Some of us just stand in need of a touch from God. And then the question is raised, have you truly allowed God to touch your heart? To touch? See, see, your life can't be changed unless God touches the heart. Most of our suffering is taking place in our mind. And if we will allow our hearts to connect with the Spirit of God. You see, God is knocking on our doors. And God is asking to let me in. It's the problem with our world. Our world has tried to take God out of the world. One philosopher, Nietzsche, has declared that God is dead. And so the suffering that we have in the world, many of us have, because we've tried to kill God in our lives. We've tried to take God out of our world. And God is still standing and ready to reconnect with his creation. That's you and that's me. A broken spirit and a contrite heart is the thing that God seeks to draw near to. What's the benefit of a broken spirit? What's the benefit of suffering? The benefit of suffering is it causes us to be broken. Has God broken you? Have you gone low enough to submit yourself to God? To submit yourself to his will. Have you gone low enough to repent of your sins? 
And the only fix, the only hope for salvation and the alleviation of suffering in this world is found in God's Son, Jesus Christ. We'd love to share with you how Jesus can change your life. How Jesus can make your life better. You come by repenting, turning away from wrongdoing, turning to righteousness. At the end of this broadcast, if you didn't get here through our website, go to our website, highway56coc.org. You can email us. We can aid in connecting you to the great God of heaven. And if you're suffering in your life, if you're looking in the world and you, you don't like what you see, man's greatest hope for salvation lies in the gift of God that was extended through his son. We'd love to help you find him on your journey. Repentance is the call of preaching. Jesus himself, as he preaches, says, Except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. I think it's a terrible thing to live in a world full of suffering, to live a life plagued with suffering, to die and go to a hell and suffer throughout all eternity. You don't have to suffer such a great loss. And God stands ready and willing to give you the greatest gift of all, the gift that is free from suffering, the gift that is called life.